previous video, we covered absolute extremes. In this video, we're covering local extremes. A local maximum looks something like this. As you can see, based on these other values over here, it's not the biggest value on the entire graph. It's a local maximum. It is the biggest if you take a very small neighborhood like this. It's like a little bump in the graph, even though it's not the biggest bump and it's not the biggest height of the graph. That's what a local max looks like, okay? There should be a small window from x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon, a small window where the height of the function at the maximum is bigger than all other x values in the interval. As you can see, this graph has multiple local maximums. Of course, we also have a couple of local mins on this graph, and the local min is, it might not be the smallest value on the entire graph, but it is the smallest value kind of compared to its nearby neighbors. That's what the epsilon is for here. As long as there's a small little neighborhood from x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon where the height of the function is the smallest, that's how you get a local min. In other words, it's a little dip in the function. Okay, how do we identify where the local max and local mins are happening? Well, it looks like the function is changing from decreasing to increasing. Changing from decreasing to increasing every time there's a local min. The local max is changing from increasing to decreasing. Remember, increasing and decreasing means that the first derivative is respectively positive and negative. So if the first derivative changes from being positive to negative, then that would look something like this. The first derivative is positive, so the function is increasing, and then it changes to be decreasing. As you can see, there's a local max right at the point where the first derivative changes from positive to negative. And similarly, if the first derivative changes from negative to positive, there is going to be a local min at that point where it changes. Okay, let's do an example. We're going to find where is the function increasing and decreasing for this function, and then we're going to list out what are the local max and local min. So we need to look at the first derivative. Let's do the work. We are calculating the first derivative using the product rule, similar to the previous video. In these examples, you will always, always, always simplify. There's no way you're going to be able to figure out where this messy quantity is positive or negative unless you simplify, okay? So let's also get a common denominator. Here we go. Getting a common denominator here. The common denominator is 2 times square root of x. We get this quantity, which is the most ideal for any of these problems, is to have a quotient where you have a thing in the numerator and a thing in the denominator. We need to find where this quantity is positive and where it is negative. So let's analyze it piece by piece. Remember, like we talked about in the previous video, exponentials are always positive. So even though it kind of looks a little messy that there's an e to the minus x out here, we don't even have to worry about that because e to the minus x is always a positive function. Okay, let's take a look at the other quantity here. Here, the function is equal to zero if the numerator is equal to zero. That's happening at x is equal to one half. As you can see from the denominator, the denominator is equal to zero at x equals zero. So we have two points here, x is equal to zero and x is equal to half, that are essentially our critical points for this problem. How we use critical points is going to be slightly different than how we used critical points in the previous video. For this, what we're going to do is we're going to take our domain. Remember the domain here for the square root function is uh, zero to infinity, including zero? What we're going to do with our critical points is we're going to subdivide the domain from zero to infinity. We're gonna subdivide it at x is equal to a half, which is one of our critical points. And now this is an exercise very similar to what you would do in pre-calculus class, where you have some quantity here, you're trying to figure out if it's positive or negative, so you figure out, well, it's equal to zero at x is equal to a half, and it does not exist at x equals zero, and then you can do a test point in each one of these intervals. Let's say x is equal to 1 fourth. We're going to plug x is equal to 1 fourth into this first derivative quantity and see what happens. e to the anything power is always a positive number. I don't even have to plug that in by, into my calculator. I can know that as a general rule. e to any number is always positive. Okay. Uh, the square root of 1 fourth is positive. And let's look at the numerator. We've got 1 minus 2 times a fourth, which gives us positive a half. Okay, so it looks like the numerator is positive 
positive as well. So we've got this is positive, this is positive, and this is positive. So we've got a positive times a positive divided by a positive. So that means that overall it's a positive quantity, and we can mark our results here saying that the first derivative is positive from 0 to a half because that's what our test point says. Let's move on to the next region from 1 half to infinity. Let me just pick the easiest test point possible at x equals 1. Plugging in to the quantity here into the first derivative, we get 1 minus 2 times 1 divided by 2 times the square root of 1. As we said a bunch of times before, e to any power is always a positive number. Uh, the square root of 1 is a positive number, and it looks like in the numerator we've got 1 minus 2, which is of course negative. So overall, we've got a negative quantity in the second portion here. So the first derivative is positive from 0 to a half, and the first derivative is negative from a half to infinity. Let's summarize our answer. The first derivative is positive. In other words, the original function is increasing from 0 to a half. The first derivative is negative. In other words, the original function is decreasing from a half to infinity. So therefore, there's a local max that occurs at x is equal to a half. Remember that the local max occurs whenever you change from increasing to decreasing. What we determined in this problem is that the function is increasing from 0 to a half, and then from a half off to infinity, the function is decreasing. That means that at x equals a half, this is where it changes from increasing to decreasing. So at x is equal to a half, it looks like we have a local maximum, okay? It is possible that in other problems you could have multiple maxes and mins if you had multiple places where it was changing from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. You'll have to analyze your problem separately. Every problem will come out differently. The fact that this is the example we're doing in the video does not mean that every example will turn out this way. You'll have to analyze your own problem according to the rules that we covered. Okay, there's something else that is natural to cover in this video as well, which is intervals of concavity. Let's cover the rules here for what you need to know. If the second derivative is negative, what that means is that the first derivative is decreasing. So what does that actually look like? If the slope slopes on the graph are decreasing. Here it's a positive slope, then it's kind of less positive, and then here the slope is zero, and then the slope becomes negative. As you can see, as we travel along this graph here, the slope starts out positive and then goes to negative. It looks like the slope or the slopes of the tangent lines are decreasing. This is what it looks like when it's concave down. Similarly, if the second derivative is positive, that means the slopes are increasing. As you can see on this plot right here, we've got negative slopes, less negative, then we have a zero slope right here, and then we have slopes that are positive. So it looks like the slopes are getting bigger, which means that the second derivative is positive, okay? The slopes are increasing. So this is concave up, okay? So the quick way of remembering it is that if the second derivative is negative, that corresponds to concave down, and if the second derivative is positive, that corresponds to concave up. Make sure you know these rules as as we move forward in the course. Okay, let's do an example here. We're gonna find the intervals of concavity. In other words, figure it out where it is concave up and where it is concave down. Concavity has to do with the second derivative, so it looks like we're gonna have to get the second derivative. First, we get the first derivative. As you can see, we're using the quotient rule here. We've done the quotient rule so many times at this point. I would encourage you to just pause the video and make sure you can follow every single step. Because we're gonna be taking the second derivative, you must simplify the first derivative as much as possible. To do the second derivative, we're also going to be using the quotient rule, taking the derivative of the first derivative in order to get the second derivative. As you can see, it looks a little bit messy here when we do the quotient rule out initially, so we must simplify. And here I'm going to uh, pull out x to the half power, simplify, 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 until we get to something which is as simple as we can possibly get it for this problem. Okay, so simplifying is now part of the problem. Problem. That is something that is new in these in the previous video and in this video. You have to simplify other things, otherwise things will get way too complicated. Okay, so the second derivative is equal to this simplified quantity down here. And of course, our goal is to figure out where is the second derivative positive and where is the second derivative negative. So we can figure out where the function is concave up and where it is concave down. Okay, let's take a look at this thing. Notice that the domain 
of our function here, because we've got a square root and we can't divide by zero, our domain is from zero to infinity. We also can't take the ln of a negative number, so the domain is definitely positive numbers, and x cannot be equal to zero, otherwise we'd be dividing by zero. So the domain is zero to infinity, not including zero. We're gonna do exactly what we did in the previous problem for the intervals of increase and decrease, except now we're doing it with the second derivative instead of the first derivative. Let's subdivide the domain into pieces. We'll look at the denominator. The denominator is equal to zero, at x equals zero. And the numerator is equal to zero, just do the math over here, at x is equal to e to the eight thirds. Make sure to check the algebra over here, maybe pause the video if we're moving too fast. Always pause the video if we're moving too fast. That is the big advantage of doing the videos. Check it out, do the algebra on your own, and see if you get the same thing. So we're taking our domain, which is zero to infinity, and we're subdividing it right here where the function or the second derivative is equal to zero right at this point. So now we can do some test points and figure out is the second derivative positive or negative in these other regions. Let's pick x equals one here. If I plug x equals one into the second derivative, we can find out, remember ln of one is equal to zero. We do a little simplifying and it looks like we get negative two. So it looks like in this region here, the second derivative is negative. In the next region, I'm just gonna pick any number Number here because I have an ln in my quantity here I'm gonna pick e to the 10 power because remember ln and e cancel each other out so if I put an e in here then the ln and the e cancel and I just get 10 times 3 halves which is the 15 okay now I just simplify a little bit it looks like 4 minus 15 would be negative 11 and then there's another minus sign out in front so overall this is a positive quantity okay so the second derivative is positive from e to the 8 thirds off to infinity okay Okay, let's summarize. From zero to e to the eight thirds, we had that the second derivative was negative. Therefore, it's concave down in that interval. From e to the eight thirds to infinity, the second derivative was positive. So it looks like it's concave up in this interval. In this video, we covered two topics. One was local extremes. In order to find the local max and local min, what you do is you figure out where is the first derivative positive and where is the first derivative negative. If the first derivative changes from positive to negative, then you have a local max. If it changes from negative to positive, then you have a local min, okay? So in order to find the local extremes, we are looking at the first derivative and figuring out where the first derivative is positive and negative. The second topic we covered is intervals of concavity. This is the exact same thing, except now with the second derivative. The second derivative being positive means that the function is concave up, and the second derivative being negative means that the function is concave down. Okay, the only real difference between these processes is that one is dealing with the first derivative and the second is dealing with the second derivative. In both of these topics, we do have to make sure that our functions are fully simplified, that we're getting common denominator, and we're pulling things together in the most simplified way possible which does involve a bunch of algebra. And only when things are simplified can you see when they're positive and when they're negative. So you gotta take your first or your second derivative and figure out how can I simplify this as much as possible in order to figure out where it's positive and where it's negative. Once you're figuring out positivity and negativity, um, using the test point method is one way, as you can see from the examples we did in this video. We either did the test point method on the first derivative, if we're looking for local max and min, or we did the test points on the second derivative if we're talking about finding concavity. There's lots and lots of algebra that comes up in these problems so make sure to review the algebra facts that we did in this video because these are the easy ones we're going to be doing more in class and of course more on the homework. Check out the book, try some extra problems before you come to class and I hope to answer as many questions as you have when you arrive to class time. I will see you then.